Archibald Wick. Um, he's working with Nick Kaiser and uh, with the permission of the Wheeler family and using uh, the official archive at the um, American Philosophical Society. And uh, uh, I knew John Wheeler very well. I'll just say a few words about that in, in a moment. But one of the distinctive features about him, two distinctive features, one, he was described as the perfect gentleman, inside of which was the perfect gentleman. And, and he was a wonderful uh, human being. But the other thing is he carried around this big leather bound notebooks, and, and every time he had a discussion, it, uh, not like today, we sort of knock about discussion and I'll email you some links and so on. I carefully write everything down. So it's a priceless archive. So those of you who've seen the film Oppenheimer, um, the elephant in the room was, was John Wheeler because he worked with Niels Bohr, established the physics of uh, nuclear fission, but he went on to found uh, the fields of, I say found, yeah, really, or the pioneer, the fields of quantum gravity and quantum cosmology. Um, I knew him very well over many years, got to know him obviously in the latter part of his life, um, and when he became profoundly interested in the nature of quantum mechanics, and, and not only quantum gravity, but you know what do quantum mechanics mean, the nature of observation, this famous uh, U uh, uh, cartoon, which he drew, the uh, U standing for universe, and then the observer. Um, and there's, uh, I could talk today about it. It's not my talk, it's, it's Baruch's talk. Um, all I want to say is the very last time that I saw John Wheeler was at his 90th, I think maybe his 91 birthday party in Princeton. Um, and a book came out of that. And I see, you're looking at the book, I'm actually an editor. There it is, uh, there it is science and ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. So a very profound thinker. Uh, with, and he's left a lot of unfinished business. And so we're going to hear about some of that this afternoon. Andrew, over to you. All right. Thank you, Paul, for the wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. And I am uh, very, very grateful to be here and uh, you know, grateful to, uh, to learn from everyone here. So we're going to go uh, go forward with this again. My name is Baruch Garcia. Um, there's a, a, I have a, that's one of my emails. Another email is jowarchive at, at Gmail. I use that one too for this. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to go kind of fast. If something goes, because uh, I'm going to try to fit everything within the hour. If something uh, is uh, real outstanding, then, then please raise your hand. If it's like if it's a little hiccup, then okay. But it's like a big hiccup, then I think it's fine to raise your hand. And then um, and then we're gonna so we're gonna try to go fast. And then uh, if, if if we go too fast, uh, Rafa has this presentation. She could email it to you. You could look it over. Okay, let's let's start. Okay, so again, this is the summary. This is the abstract that uh, uh, you can read it yourself. You guys know how to read, but basically for over 30 years, uh, when you look at John Wheeler, uh, his work, you look at his published work. I read his published work for, for several years. Uh, you know, it was, it was interesting. If you read it, it looks, it looks kind of like very esoteric poetry. It doesn't look like a physics paper at all, uh, these things. Although he did have a prosaic style for instance, his work with Fein with uh, Feynman, with Bohr, uh, his work on, on gravity was 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 very uh, well established. But then in the seventies and after the se uh, starting in the early seventies, and there's he, he did see hints of this of this um, uh, poetic style even in the fifties. But in the seventies and after that, you start seeing. Uh, this stuff about uh, about law without law and and about it from bit it from bit didn't come until 1989, but uh, you start seeing all these these uh, very poetic things and he he quotes Shakespeare and he quotes um, he he quotes the Talmud and he quotes things that you would not see in in a in a physics paper at all and uh, and uh, and and uh, artists he quotes artists and it's just very it's very difficult to see to make sense of this so what we're going to do is we're going to try to unpack this a little bit because you look at the published essays and you're saying what am i looking at but then when you look at his notebooks uh, in, in uh, philadelphia like, okay now i know what i know what he's doing and it makes a little bit more sense when you look at his actual notebooks so just a, a little note on this stuff uh, one sentence, so let's see here. This sentence right here, I want to emphasize 
There's a laser. Indeed, we can see in quantum formalism that one must choose between consistent unitary evolution and demonstra demonstrable. I'm going to explain what that is. That's provable, something you can see. Uh, Non-unitary measurement, illuminating a path forward that unites the foundations of mathematics with the foundations of science. Uh, so, and it, it, we're going to apply it to several parts of, of gravity within, of uh, quantum mechanics, I'm sorry, within one hour. We're going to go real quick. And then uh, we're going to talk about this one particular problem of compact form manifolds, um, where um, they, the, uh, in short, the homeomorphism problem for, uh, for compact form manifolds is undecidable. Mm -hmm. And so this is allowed at the Planck scale because uh, there's at the topological censorship theorem. Uh, says that uh, it, it because it violates a null energy condition, and so you can have exotic uh, topologies. But we're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth. Okay, so let's talk about this real quick. So here's some quotes. Uh, I'm not going to read through the quotes. You could read these on your own for time's sake. Malasena was basically saying Wheeler might be right. So there's Malasena uh, drawing a picture that was back in 2015. Uh, there was a wit on Wheeler. There's a really great interview. I encourage you to read. It's called uh, "A Physicist Physicist Ponders Reality." It's a Quantum Magazine interview, 2017. Again, uh, uh, Wit Witten talks about this thing. He says there's still something we have to learn about this. Now, one of the things that's important about this is a lot of people, Melvin and Witten, did get this right that the self-referential universe that's it from bit. Some people see the phrase it from bit, and it's become somewhat of a Rorschach test for a lot of physicists where they're just like, it from bit is, you know, it's about the land our limit, but it's about this. And yeah, there are connections to that. They say, is it, is it, it's just about, what, what is it about information? It's coming from information, but it's very, very, very vague. And, and so when you see people write about it from bit in literature, it's just kind of whatever they think think how they think information uh, plays a role in physics. But Wheeler had a very specific thing and Malison and Witten actually do get this right, that if from bit is not just whatever you feel about information in physics, it's about the self-referential um, uh, universe. And if, indeed, if you look at the abstract for the if from bit paper from 1989, uh, then uh, it's, it's, it, 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 talks, it talks briefly about that towards the very end of the, of the abstract. Um, and again, I'm gonna I'm writing a book with Dave Kaiser from MIT. We're gonna go over some of these things in the book in more detail. Okay, uh, so it's Witten on Wheeler. So Feynman on Wheeler, he says, I, this is short enough to read. His ideas are strange. I don't believe them at all, but it's surprising how often we realize later that he was right. So that sounds like Feynman. Okay, so Wheeler's first moral principle. I'm not gonna say that you need to follow this in your own research, but this is how Wheeler works. So you can understand, unpack what we're doing here. He would say, figure out the answer first. I'm paraphrasing. He would say, estimate, you know, use use physical principles, and then uh, calculate. And you, and again, an example I'm using here is his essays post seventies. But he also did this with Feynman when he talked about the electron going back and forth in time. And Feynman, uh, uh, oh, I put Hawking. That should say Beckenstein. That's a mistake. That's an embarrassing mistake. It's, he talked with Beckenstein with the uh, with the uh, with uh, Beckenstein was his graduate student. I'm sorry, I had a. That's that's wrong. Okay. Anyways, uh, so let's let's try to move on forward. So it went under uh, a lot of names. We have Billy Law with law without law and from bit. Okay. Here's just one of the very first times you start seeing it pop up. This was at his 60th mm -hmm. birthday, where he wrote Gödel's uh, proof too important to be left to the mathematicians. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and so again, you you see that there. You don't see him mention Gödel in his published work a lot. However, if you look in his notebooks, it's Gödel's theorem is mentioned hundreds of times throughout from 1971 through 2002. It's mentioned so it's over 30 years. You see Gödel, 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 Gödel throughout the course of decades, and you also see Tarski. If y'all are familiar with Tarski's end of findability theorem, not Tars not the tarski banach uh, uh, paradox, which which is something different, but the Tarski's end of findability theorem. It's the same Tarski though. But anyway, so we say for so. Basically, he was obsessed. So just to give you some background about this, because I think it's worth mentioning, he was he was finishing up Gravitation, MTW, with Misner and Thorne. And I was talking to Misner about this, too, uh, uh, years ago. But it was that he said they went, they were at the Institute for Advanced Studies. And uh, and he said, I wonder, he says, you know, let's go ask Gödel about 
uh, about if there's a link between quantum mechanics and undecidability. And uh, and Goodall was um, Goodall uh, uh, kicked in, in Wheeler's words, he kicked him out of his office. And so Wheeler was like, "What's going on?" He saw him two years later. And Goodall instead of wanting to talk about rotating galaxies and, and the the Goodall solution to see if that's something that would uh, happen in our universe. And so, um, and so he kicked him out. Two years later, he saw him at a at a cocktail party, and he said, "Hey, why'd you kick me out?" And we have the I have the letter from that that I'm going to put in the book too. Why'd you kick me out? Uh, and he he did a follow up letter, and Gödel essentially the long story short, he's a Platonist like Einstein was. Einstein and Gödel walked to the institute all the time, and so uh, and so yeah. So there's that. Okay, we're going to keep an eye on time there. Okay, so. You can read this on your own. Uh, the only thing I'm going to uh, go is I come here to territory that would take a good old, a, a good old to navigate. So anyways, um, so he talked about this one uh, philosopher who I actually spoke with and was a little bit, uh, was a little bit lost on this. So it says, so uh, Ben Frozen is my next bet, but Ben Frozen was a little bit. And notice here, this is very interesting. I encourage you to look over the slides yourself. You have Parmenides, Plato, and Aristotle. Okay, it's from January 3rd. This is straight from his archive in Philadelphia. It's a little bit cut off there. Um, that's how it was in the archive. Okay, this is something on your own, von Neumann on Gödel. The only thing I want to uh, emphasize here is that uh, there's still some people that say, yeah, Gödel's, uh, you know, philosophical. No, Gödel's not philosophical. Or, I mean, it has an impact on, on philosophy, as does general relativity have an impact on philosophy, as does quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. but they're real... It's a real, it's real stuff. It's not just philosophical. You, you, uh, undecidability has been applied to, uh, to you know, combinatorics, um, uh, to linear algebra, to uh, to nonlinear, uh, to um, uh, nonlinear systems, to uh, to topology, which we're going to talk about. So it is a it is a real it is a real thing. Actually, there's a paper I didn't put here by uh, Poonin called Sampler. Uh, it's like a, a sampler for undecidable problems. It's interesting. It goes through how uh, he has a few mistakes in that paper. Uh, for instance, he says that, that Gödel and Turing are two different things. They're not. They're the same thing. But but otherwise, it's a it's a good resource to look into that. Okay. So let's look at this Tarski. So this is the other thing that you see a lot in uh, in his notebooks. You could look right now. Do a Google search. You're a Google Scholar search. You're not going to find Tarski in any physicist paper. But with with Wheeler, he was obsessed with Tarski, and specifically Tarski's indefinability theorem. Not a lot of math, not a lot of mathematicians know about Tarski's indefinability theorem, and even fewer uh, physicists, I think, know about it. But just take it to say it's it's Gödel's theorem is about uh, syntax, and uh, Tarski's is about semantics. So it's it's the flip side to Tarski, and according to a story uh, uh, in mathematics. Um, Murkowski, I think, or Murkowski, he was he he wrote about how Gödel actually discovered Tarski's theorem, but didn't publish it because it was not in vogue at that time in his circles. But, but Tarski was in Poland, and he could publish on that, and he published uh, years later. But they're the same thing. So let's look at this really quick. He goes, um, he's he's talking about Tarski. So Tarski is about talking about truth and and, and the concept of truth. We're going to talk about it uses something called the use mentioned distinction or quotation. It's what a good old number is. It's the difference between an object and the name of the object. So it says, uh, truth is a meta concept participator here, because he talked about the participator. Again, let's look back again real quick, because I think this is really important. This entire talk can be summed up with this picture. It's very confusing, but this is an entire talk right there. Okay. So it's just, that's a participator looking there. And so it, what Gödel is looking at in that 1972 entry, I think it's 1972, is that the participator would correspond to naming an object. What, what's the quotation marks? This is what is necessary for Gödel's theorem. Okay. So let's look at it real quick. Okay. Uh, so why did Wheeler falter? This is just my guess. Because uh, I, I just put this here because people ask me, many people have asked me this. And I think it's just because the the textbook he was using, he mentioned what the textbook he was using, and uh, this guy Rogers, uh, he just really glided over. He really didn't go, glazed over this use mentioned distinction, which we're going to talk about right here. Okay, so this is just a book by uh, Willard Van Allen Klein, who is a really important logician, and he basically just says here um, that 
strict uh, observance between use and mention of expression of essential to a thinking. It's the difference between a number and a numeral. Okay, so you can have Arabic numerals, uh, Roman numerals, Greek, uh, you know, whatever kind of numerals, Mayan numerals, but the number is the same. There's a difference between how it's written and what it is. So it, he goes. Clarity is indispensable in particular to an understanding of Gödel's and of Tarski's work on truth. These are the two things that you see show up in Wheeler's notebooks hundreds of times. So this is what I'm saying. This is what Wheeler was missing, was this idea here, and this is where we're picking up. Okay, so just to look over the use mentioned distinction, it's actually not that not that difficult. We have number versus numeral. So look at this, uh, let's say, and then pseudocode print X and Y, that's just two characters versus print X and Y, that's three characters. This is the one that Quine used, and this is famously taught in analytic philosophy. Boston is populous. I forgot the period there. Boston, in quotation marks, is disyllabic. Okay? So it's a difference between that's the object and that's the name of the object. Boston has people and Boston has two syllables. Okay, so again, why are we talking about this? This is the, 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 the key of how these theorems work, is this use mentioned distinction. It's very important. You can't prove on the side of building without the quotation mark, without girl numbering, or without something uh, similar to that. All right. So I'm not going to get into this. You could read this on your own. This just I'm just saying that sometimes people use corner quotes, but this is what I prefer to use corner quotes. I'm not going to get into this. That's, that's a... Okay, so this is a, a fun little a fun little example of uh, why quotation is important in uh, diagonalization, which is using Gödel's proof. This is fun. I think it's Lance Fortnow who came up with this, but I'm not, I couldn't really trace it back. That's my best guess of who who. So Greeling's paradox was obviously it came up with someone named Greeling, but uh, the idea is written is something that is written. Uh, written is also polysyllabic. Uh, poly, polysyllabic is polysyllabic. French is not, itself is not French. It's an English word. So if something is, describes itself, then it's heterological. If it's not, then it's not heterological. So um, again, you could look on this and if you know Gödel's theorem, you could just come back to this for fun. Okay, so, but the only reason I put this up there is to emphasize the importance of quotation. Okay, so again, sometimes you'll see quotation written as these, uh, I guess, GMAs right here. And then this is the halting problem. I'm not gonna stop here. There's a ton of, of YouTubes on the halting problem, all right? Do we know, do, does there, raise your hand if you know about Gödel's there more or less. Okay, let me take some time to, to talk about it in a very short way. So if you say, um, so this is the acceptance problem. So this might be a little bit, okay. So in, in, in a nutshell, this, Statement is not provable. Okay, so I'm, I'm really, I'm, this is a, a condensed form. So this statement is not provable. If it's true, then it's not provable. If it's false, then it's provable. So truth and provability can't be. Um, it, there's a point where they're not always at the same at the same thing. All right, does that make sense, more or less? It's like the layer paradox. Okay, and I might, and I, I maybe I could come back again and and talk about the actual proof a little bit more in detail. Mm -hmm. Because because Gödel's theorem it, it's it's really confusing at first, but once you get it, you're like, oh wow, that makes sense. And this is actually um, uh, this is it's called diagonalization. And so uh, another way of saying it is so uh, you could look at this on your own. This is called the acceptance problem. It says accept and reject. You could also do it with halt and never halt, and it'll come out the same. Um, there's a reason I'm not going to get into why that's the acceptance problem, but okay, let's go on here. Okay, so with Gödel's theorem, like I said, something could be uh, provable, but not consistent. And I'm just, I'm calling that, this is not the, in the literature, I'm calling that case one for simplicity, or it could be consistent, but not provable. And I'm calling that case two. And I think, I think Paul said something along the lines that Gödel's theorem was the greatest discovery. Are you saying okay, so Yes, I was about to interject to say, for those who don't know it, I think it's the most profound thing known to human beings because almost everything else we know, everything else tells us about what we know. This tells us about not, not only what we don't know, but what we can never know. Yes. Do y'all get what Paul said? That's kind of why this is important, what Paul just said. It's really important. 
And and just to, to go back, ex excellent. Well, well, Paul, Paul said it perfectly. And I mean, I would go back here just to, if, on your own time, read what von Neumann said. Everyone here knows who von Neumann was. It's pretty serious. I mean, just let's take a little bit just to, to know. I'm just trying to convince you to put a little bit of time to figure to. You could look online. There's really easy descriptions of, of, uh, um, of look for the halting problem. That's probably going to be easier to start off with. Do the industrial build the halting problem. In Gödel's theorem, it, it comes out as a corollary, even though even though chronologically Gödel came first. Uh, so as the first man to demonstrate, blah, blah, blah. I'm just trying to get through this. The result is remarkable. It's quasi-paradoxical self-denial. Um, uh, so I think there's... I think I'm missing a paragraph here. <laughs> Anyways, okay. The point is it's important. As Paul said very eloquently, girl is very important. And Wheeler was Wheeler was struggling with it. Maybe some other time I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Goodall's theorem in a little bit of depth and how it's a corollary of uh, Turing's uh, halting problem. Okay. In both cases, so case one, you could either you choose between being provable and not consistent. Case two, it could be consistent but not provable. In both cases, there's no provability and consist consistency simultaneously. And, and, and what you're looking for is for this generalized uh, algorithm where there is provability and consistency. I think I mentioned that I go to was Einstein's like best friend, right? And just to emphasize, I mean, that's anecdotal. It has nothing to do with the theorem, but my point well, is- I think Einstein said the only reason he went to work was to walk home with girl. Yes, he said the only reason he went home to her is to, he said, my, he said, my research is useless. Uh, he goes, the only reason I go to the Institute, the Institute for Advanced Studies, is to walk home with girl. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Rule of quotation. So this, if you don't know Gödel's theorem, this might be a little bit, a uh, little bit fast. Uh, so I apologize. If you do know Gödel's theorem, and I'll try to get to the physics soon. If you do know Gödel's theorem, uh, this will maybe clear up a little bit of things. And again, this is so we have the use mentioned distinction. So remember, Boston is different from Boston. Boston has people. Boston has two syllables, right? So if you're going to self-reference, something's going to be self-referential to itself. And if it's if you quote it, Boston, you see saying something in ink, it's written down. Or better yet, uh, a, a better thing, a better example is a number versus a numeral. There's two, like there's two, the concept of two, and there's two, the numeral two, written like this. One is you're actually ink and it has a shape, right? There's a difference between number and numeral. And you could choose Roman numerals, you could choose uh, Maya numerals, you could choose uh, you know cuneiform or whatever. And so, but the point is that there's a distinction. So when you have self-reference and you put the distinction on there, then you have this contradiction. This is just kind of breaking down why quotation is so important is so important to this uh, to uh, Gödel's theorem. As uh, Willard van Arman Quine, who was uh, um, I encourage you to read his stuff, was uh, always talking about. So examples of self-referential quotation: what happens to see Gödel's theorem, Tarski's theorem, uh, Turing's proof for the halting problem, for which you can see Gödel's theorem as a corollary of that. Uh, uh, Scott Aronson's book, um, Quantum Computing Since Democritus, talk, uh, does a good job of uh, describing how Gödel's theorem comes from Turing's proof. You have Quine's proto-syntax, which very few people know about, but it's very, very interesting. Uh, it's just, it gets into the actual, so it's syntax without the membership operator, and uh, syntax of first order logic. We have oracle machines, which we're not going to get into, but right? well, we have to get into, because it's how we're going to describe entanglement. Xeno machines, Homograph complexity changes and complete the same heart mass and turns as complexity theory. And that's also uh, something about complexity theory. Okay, so I'm just giving you a really simple example here. Just a, this is like a really simple case to try to break down everything. So if you just imagine there's, I'm just writing this thing iota. That's right there. That's a iota math, I think, uh, uh, font, whatever. It's just there, if that's the only thing, and then you put quotation marks, then by definition, it has to be referring to itself. So that's like the simplest form of self-reference with quotation you can get. So you could either include the corner quotes, and then and then that's case one where it's written, you're looking at the actual shape of the glyph, or you could exclude the corner quotes. And, and so it's written, it'd be written there, but it's self, you have that distinction. So it's distinct from itself, that's where you get the contradiction from, or you could exclude the corner quotes. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, should, should I continue? Okay. All right. So so you could you could I was uh okay, so we're gonna look at this real quick. So so again, so look at inconsistency in mathematics and, and what and what I mean. So we want to get on the same lexicon of what I mean by inconsistency in sorry. Uh, okay. There is some I, I think I, I have to oh you're you're not connected to the Sorry about that. Oh, it's fine. Here, how about this? How about this? Why don't are am, are we still uh are we still uh recording or no? We, we yeah. But it won't record your slides because yeah, the slides are being recorded some... in the room, so you need to be in the room. There are some people on Zoom. I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I thought I could fix let's, it. With... Let's see if we can fix it now. So can you sign back in? Technology in this room. <laughs> <laughs> the internet. I think oh, it's disconnected fun. from the Wi-Fi. That's why. Yeah. Oh, because I'm is it because I'm on the it says. Yeah, so maybe maybe we can take a pause for a moment and get you signed back in. Oh, okay, so while while you're doing this, why don't I talk about answer questions about Gödel's theorem, right? So let's let's use this. So do you, okay? So the way this usually works, and I'm just gonna keep on going without the slides, is that if you have it could for something, um, Gödel's theorem deals with something called piano arithmetic, but Turing, uh. And then, okay, we're just going to use, uh, the other use another computer. Let's do that. Okay. So Turing, uh, so Gödel came up with this stuff in 1931, Turing 1936, but Turing's even, Gödel said to himself, is is my voice still recorded right now? Yeah. Okay, my voice is still recorded. Okay, that's fine. So, uh, so uh, Gödel even said that uh, Turing is um, his his methods were superior to Gödel's, so I would encourage you to look at Turing, and um, and then do it. There's this, so there's a notion. Uh, what we talk about provability, it's called the effective method. The effective method means you have to prove. So it just means that the proof is a mechanical, it's a physical proof. It's something that is done with numerals. If I'm going to write you a proof on the a mathematical proof, I need to write. It with numerals and with symbols. I can't just I can't prove something with numbers. I need to prove it with numerals. I need to show you on it. That's what a proof is, right? So and so that's what the this concept of effective method is. You said you can't have uh, a generalized algorithm will give you a proof, an effective method with uh, with um, uh, with numerals, and it will. Uh, uh, and it will be consistent. So what what Turing showed was that you can't have something that's provable and consistent, and you and you get uh, uh, good from that. And so basically, what happens is that let's connect that to quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, you can either have a unitary uh, unitary um, uh, evolution. In that case, by definition, you cannot measure psi. You can't measure the state vector, right? So it's not measurable, but it is consistent. If you if you have the 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 if you if you start psi, if you start a wave function here in an in, in initial condition, it'll be the same way every time, right? It's consistent every time, but you can't you can't measure it directly by definition. However, if you do want to measure it, let's say for instance you uh, prepare a uh, let's say you prepare a uh, a spin z plus state and measure it in the x thing. Sometimes you'll see it uh, in, a, in the x axis. Sometimes you'll measure it as x plus, but then you could do it again. It'll be not x plus. Do you understand? So we have the same thing that is in Gödel's theorem and in incompleteness as we have in quantum mechanics. You have, and it works in the same exact way. And I think Penrose was talk, has talked about this again like uh, numerous times. Uh, he's emphasized this. He calls it the U process and the R process. The U process being unitary and then the R process being the reductory. So in, on my slides, uh, that it, it basically is um, uh, the U process is just, well, you, you could figure out which one's unitary and which one's non-unitary. U is unitary. That's So it's the same exact thing as Penrose's process U and process R. I don't think I have it on the slide, but it's the same thing. 
Okay, so if you want to look into that. And, and Penrose was, was pushing that this is really important. This is why, where Everett came out of. Everett, Everett came out, uh, you look at his uh, paper, came out of, you know, you had, he called it process one and process two after von Neumann's uh, 1930 uh, book, 1931 book on quantum mechanics. And so, and so basically, so does that make sense? So in Gödel's theorem, you can have something that's provable, but inconsistent, or you could have it consistent, but not provable. And by provable, it means you have a numeral, you could write something down. In quantum mechanics, you can have something that's measurable, right? You can have like a dot on a screen, but it is uh, measurable, but it is uh, inconsistent. So in other words, and I'm not saying that quantum mechanics is wrong or inconsistent by any ways. Quantum mechanics is the most firmly established theory we have, just to be clear. So uh, so it goes, so it could be provable. You see a dot on the screen, but it could be up here for like Stern girl. It could be up here. It could be down here with the same exact initial condition. Or it could be consistent, but you can't see it. So, so does everyone see that connection? Are we, we're good. <laughs> I can see it. Though. He can see it. So, <laughs> so Paul, when I talked to Paul, Paul was able to finish my sentence when I did that. And so that's how I knew that Paul got it. Because <laughs> the thing is, it, it, you know, and I, I just want to say something, because that's kind of the, the heart of this, uh, of, of the, these arguments in order to make any kind of like technical progress is that, so Paul got it, I, I was saying, I, I, this is anecdotal, but I think it's important, is I was talking to one of my friends, he, he works for Apple, but he has a background, he has a PhD in uh, computer science and in uh, master's in physics, so he's he's pretty strong on this. And we're just having coffee, he's like, hey, I'm explaining this to you, and he goes, and he was getting really irate, he goes, you know, you don't understand uh, diagonalization, you don't understand the, the, the undecidability, and he's getting very right, he's a really nice guy, but this guy, he was getting very, very right. He goes, you don't know what you're talking. You, you, you just don't understand. And then somewhere along the line, he goes, wait. Oh. And then he started finishing the sentences because this seems to be something where once you get it, you're like, oh, okay, now I get it. So Paul got it. <laughs> Paul's, Paul's the, yeah. But then I was exposed to a lot of weirdisms in the early days. So. Yeah, you were, so you were, you were prepared for this. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're good here. This is all the things I talked about here. So we have prepared. So why is this important? This is important because in good old Sam, we have epistemological limits, limits to what we can know to a priori mathematics. In quantum mechanics, you have a, uh, you have a posteriori uh, limit epistemological limits. You have a connection to these two things that place limits on what we can know as humans. One's from math, one's from physics. Both are at the foundation, one's at the foundation of math, one's at the foundation of physics, and they're both and they both mirror each other. And it's not just a superficial thing. Let's look at these other things here. So here's an example I said. This is an Arabic numeral displayed on an LCD screen. Again, proof requires numerals, not just numbers. The numbers themselves are not observed. And this is a photon hitting a uh, silver chloride uh, screen. Uh, I think you do bromide chloride too. The experiment requires, a macroscop requires macroscopic information, not just psi alone. Psi itself is not observed, just like how numbers themselves are not observed. All right, L, is that making sense a little bit? Okay, all right, so there's the numeral, there's the, so my point is that this is macroscopic information that you can communicate to each other. And Wheeler often talked about the importance of communication of information. It has to be communicable. And he talks about this very much, okay. But I don't talk about it on the slides, maybe I'll talk about it next time. Slides. Okay, so again, here's just a short thing. The good old quantum correspondence. These are two very fundamental, is a very fundamental thing in mathematics, very fundamental thing in physics. Case one, demonstrable, provably consistent. It corresponds with what I call, I'm, I'm calling these things to, for simplicity's sake, category one, which is demonstrable. Again, I, I, I'm defining here what I mean by demonstrable on the slides. Clear information here, right? Okay, so demonstrable or measurable uh, by inconsistent. So it's a non-unitary measurement. Or case two, you have consistent but not demonstrable, and category two is consistent but not uh, uh, consistent but not demonstrable slash measurable. Okay, if you work in foundations of quantum mechanics, this should make a little bit of sense to you. And if you know quantum mechanics and Gödel's theorem, this should make a lot of sense to you. Okay, so again, this is just a, a nice little sum a summary. One must choose, be choose between demonstrable non-unitary quantum measurement and consistent unitary evolution. So that kind of is a nutshell of how you tie these both things together.
Again, like I said, this connects foundations of science with the foundations of mathematics, epistemological, epistemological limits of science with the epistemological um, uh, limits of mathematics. Okay, so this is something you could, I'm not going to get into because uh, you need to know what oracles are to do this, but basically they can determine semantic or functional properties, like whether or not a certain machine will halt for Turing machines, not equivalent to itself, but when applied to itself, it's undecidable. And so that's kind of what, uh, what uh, entanglement does it tell you about another subsystem. Okay, so probability one or zero, there's something called trivial semantic property. And that's like saying this statement is provable or like with the Greenland paradox, a concept of something that's homological. Um, again, we don't have enough time to get into that, but let's go ahead. That's just some uh, some things about uh, the quantum formalism, lin about linearity, um, linear complex amplitudes, a lot how it fits into this category, ca one category, two thing. I don't know if, how much of this stuff is my own and how much of this stuff is from other people, or, or like if other people have come across this. A lot of this stuff seems kind of trivial to me, but we, maybe we'll do this at another time. But that might even be its own talk or just because it's a lot of stuff. Okay, quantum cosmology real quick. We have to understand, we have to include the observer, just like as uh, Witten uh, was saying, that we need to account for the observer within the system. And so Wheeler was forced to think about this after doing the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. And so this is something that we uh, that we need to include. And so this is, this Gedelian quantum mechanics allows for this, allows for a observer within uh, described by quantum mechanics. So again, the, the formalism of quantum mechanics comes from naturally from the suffer. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Bohr versus Everett. Here's the whole thing about Bohr. I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Bohr uh, was saying, you know, you got, you have uh, unitary evolution on unitary measurement. And Everett was saying, um, I spelled Everettian right? I think I did. Yeah. So it's like, so Everett was saying, uh, and you know, other people like Weinberg too, who was saying, hey, we should only have one set of laws. There's only one nature. So it should just be unitary evolution. And so, but with this, we do have one set of laws. It's Gödel's theorem. It's the diagonalization theorem. So there's no need for Everett or any other, or any other uh, thing like that. This is very, a lot of material, very, very fast. Okay, so let's get down to some uh, breast tacks here. So undecidability of the homeomorphism problem for causal diamonds, which are compact four manifolds. Okay, so if we look at this, um, uh, so the undecidability of compact four manifolds is a mathematical uh, result that was uh, discovered by Markov, who's the son of the famous Markov. So it's, a, you know, so it's A. Markov Jr. They have the same exact name. Uh, it, it built on work from by Den in 1912. Anyways, long story short, I'm not going to go into the history of it, but everyone here knows what homeomorphism is, right? Yeah, okay. A donut's the same thing as a coffee mug, right? Everyone knows that. So uh, so for in, in four-dimensional uh, homeomorphism, we have other factors to take care of, more than just holes. It gets more complicated. But the point is that uh, it's undecidable, all right? So... Uh, so the thing is, if you look at classical, and here's the thing, I think there's there's some GR people in here. If you look at classical GR, a causal diamond is a classical GR object, and you want to, uh, the it exists in classical GR. It does, it exists there. There's no, there's no uh, uh, homeomorphism, um, uh, there's no uh, a generalized algorithm for the homeomorphism problem, you can't uh, classify it. But here's the thing, I'm walking right here and I'm not seeing crazy topologies in space and time. I'm walking here, I'm not walking through a wormhole. Why is that? It should, it is in classical GR, but why don't we see, you know, wormholes on our way to work and all that stuff. Reason why is because uh, when, when you do it with just classical GR, um, it is, uh, it exists, but then once you put in Planck's constant, it, it, um, keeps the fluctuations down to the Planck scale due to the topological censorship theorem, which uh, because at the Planck scale, the null energy condition is violated. You could look in that on your own, but basically allows for, for all kinds of topo topological fluctuations at the Planck scale. So again, how many of you have heard of quantum foam, right? Topological fluctuations in space-time at the, at the Planck scale. 
So, uh, so that this really Wheeler, wasn't it? That, that was Wheeler. That was Wheeler in the fifties. So Wheeler in the fifties, he started coming up with that. And, and, actually, and wormhole and black hole. And wormhole, yeah. Wheeler came up with with quantum foam, wormhole, and black hole. This guy's important. Wheeler's important. Girl's important. Look over these notes later. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So okay. Anyway, so basically, uh, what you have is is um, he came up with this qualitative idea of topology fluctuations at the Planck scale. But what this does is this puts uh, some mathematical teeth on this concept. Instead of just being a cartoon, a picture, you have this undecidability of the whole neomorphism problem, and then the undecidability as I taught you, as I, as I, I, just, I, just, I, taught, I just, just showed you guys, and as Paul was talking about, it's it's got that connection to uh, pump theory. Okay. So Hawking was the first one to notice this, but for the topology of the universe, so the whole universe had to be compact. But, and he tried to get around it saying, oh, let's just uh, take, look over it. statistically, it shouldn't make a difference. But I think it's a big, it bothered Hawking in his 1978 paper, it's called Space Time Foam. It, it, bought, it should bother you, I feel like if you're being very honest. Garrosh, and, uh, Garrosh Garak and Harl, um, when, in 1986, they have, uh, it's called Computability in Physics, they come up with a paper uh, that that said instead of saying let's get around this, they said this could mean that undecidability uh, plays a role in quantum gravity. And Penrose has endorsed this, and uh, Emperor's New Mind, and many other books as well. Uh, but here's the thing: uh, Hawking uh, is it Garrosh or Garak? I was I emailed him a lot. I mean, but yeah, I, never I don't think him. I ever met him, but I was thinking Garrosh. Okay, Garrosh. There you go. Arnold Penrose only considered compact universes, but we don't know if our universe is compact or not. We don't have any kind of cosmological data for that. However, with causal diamonds, it could be compact or not. It doesn't matter. The overall topology of the universe doesn't matter. So that's why, uh, so I so I just, I realized we could just do this with causal diamonds and causal diamonds are really important. Again, y'all know what homeomorphisms are. You okay, tell some of the people here what a causal diamond is. Okay, causal diamond. I just made a causal diamond right there. So that's it, that's it. It's like you have you have a light cone going this way, Everyone knows a light cone is, and then the light cone at the other end, and then where they intersect, that's a causal diamond. There's another way to define a causal diamond, which is by a, a product topology, but that's not the way I'm defining. I'm defining it by the intersection of two light cones. Okay, so we're good. So you just made a compact four manifold by snapping your fingers twice. All right, so that's it. All right, let's look at and again. So I I call this good old foam. I'm just I'm just calling it my own head. That's what it is because it combines the uh, uh, Wheeler's quantum foam. And again, if you look at MTW, Gravitation, page 1212, he talks about how he thinks girls then will play a role in, uh, in um, uh, quantum gravity. So, okay. Uh, so, okay, just read these, read these uh, quotes on your own. Here's one from Lee Smolin and one from Tom Bates. Okay, there's a well-known theorem in Lynching geometry. It says that the metric is completely determined in terms of properties of its collection of causal diamonds. Okay, so you just, you could build everything from causal diamond. Quantum mechanics is fundamentally, from Lee Smolin, quantum mechanics is fundamentally about one system of nature probing the rest. Uh, go ahead, just read through that. Uh, making them primary structures. Okay, there's the there's the, the things there. So I, I believe they could be uh, primary structures for approaching uh, uh, more deeper understanding of gravity. There you go, snap your fingers twice to make a causal diamond. You don't have to do any crazy experiments. You don't have to get any funding for that, right? Does time have to be a static structure though? Like you have to have like, it's like a crystal. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so here's the thing. If you have a causal diamond, it's gotta be, the causal diamond itself has to be bigger than the Planck scale. The fluctuations are gonna happen inside, the topological fluctuations are gonna happen in it. So, okay. so cause here, this is a background independent. If you're, are you asking this, this is background independent. Okay. So, so that's also another plus. I didn't put on the slide, but this is a background independent approach, which is what you want in a theory of quantum gravity. All right. So again, uh, so again, this is a little bit more into detail. How, like, I won't get into this from again MTW, but it just says you know you have three geometries. You, so for three dimensional topology, if this is the right route, you should expect decidable, uh, dis a decidable homeomorphic problem, and then. With four, you don't get it. And this stuff tells what's Perlman, Gregory Perlman, you know, the, the what's the Play Institute winner and Thurston's discovery that three manifolds are indeed classifiable. That kind of dovetails into this 
whole AGM formalism. Okay, let's look at semi-classical gravity and we're running low on time. So I'm gonna to try to go super fast. Uh, it's expectation value. And so, you know, okay, I'm gonna go real fast. Expectation value. And again, you put causal diamonds on, I really just imagine them straddling the entire horizon here. This is supposed to be, I'm not artistic at all. And I was having trouble with it. Just imagine the causal diamonds straddling the horizon here. And then, and so, uh, Shannon entropy is uh, is a decidable uh, uh, quantity. So what what gives? Okay, here's what gives. Okay, again I, again I talked. To, uh, so Shannon entropy and, and uh, algorithmic uh, complexity uh, uh, are related, are asymptotically related, as you would expect a semi-classical theory to be related because it deals with the expectation value of the undecidable uh, algorithmic complexity. And again with uh, we we do we deal with the expectation values. Okay, we're going super fast here. Restricting topologies is the only objection I've heard again from my friend Scott Aronson and also from uh, Steve Carlett. But what I was saying is that there's nothing within the postulates of quantum mechanics and general relativity that restricts topology. If you want to prove that there's a restriction, you could you could just I could just say right now, let's restrict the topology, and that's fine. But if you want to prove that's how nature is, you have to define, you have to find a third theory besides general relativity and quantum mechanics that restricts it, because it's not found in the postulates of general relativity or quantum mechanics. Um, here's some notes on phenom phenomenology I won't get into. Okay, we get to this real quick. We learn biology. So he played, he toyed around with this, but not very deep. So uh, in um, other words, all these different definitions for life are about self-reference. Um, can read this on your own. So, so there's some people like Paul who look at quantum biology and there's people that look at uh, biology as self-referential. So why not this Wheeler saying, why not both? And so we're looking at both, right? So self-referential and quantum, what is that? That's Wheeler stuff. So basically, uh, you know, I mean, he, he didn't go too deep into this and he did uh, cite, uh, he did look at uh, the work of uh, Varela. Um, you would, I think Paul might be the only person who knows who Varela is here. Yeah, but anyways, so that's that. Okay, epistemology, we talked about that. Uh, we're going to go a little bit for fast. Uh, Wheeler's delayed choice experiment. Uh, that I think will have uh, an important thing because you could have these life forms evolve, you know, whatever, billions of years later, and then he's using that. Okay. All right, let's go. Okay, so real quick, you can read that on your own. He didn't think that. Uh, that all these questions, uh, how come um, uh, the quantum, how come uh, it would, he didn't think that would be part of philosophy or theology or speculation, but matters of science. Although he himself was religious, it was he was very culturally religious, but not, he thought these fundamental things were something to be left to science. Okay, so there's two questions. Wheeler's insight might be a key thing to me. This, uh, okay, so this is what Wheeler said in an interview with Kenneth Ford, who I had, who I got to meet with a little bit, but he said, uh, this is online, you could look on YouTube. Wheeler's insight might be the key thing. To me, quantum theory is the great mystery that we will someday unravel and understand how come. And the answer to that question will at the same time be the answer to the question, how come existence? I can't believe they're se uh, separate questions. Okay, so again, we can talk about what is science. So look at Quine and AJ Air. That's another topic to discuss another time. So let's look at this really quick before we run out of time. Uh, so how come the quantum? That's a posteriori and inductive. And again, there's people who try to connect Gödel to quantum there. And how come existence? That's a priori and deductive. Deductive. And so this argument, these arguments. And again, uh, Yaki, who is a theologian and physicist, he uh, looked. He was the first one to take this epistemological uh, thing, but Hawking also described it in his book, A Prevert uh, History of Time, and also a lecture at Texas A&M University. Okay, they both deal, the point is, they both deal with epistemological limits, things that we fundamentally cannot know. It's a humbling answer. Okay, so we're gonna go over this. So just there's undefinable versus undefined. The point is that you can't define it no matter how much you want. I'm going super fast because we're running short on time. Okay, so here's something from Misner, Thorne, and Zurich. So if you think Wheeler's crazy, a lot of people <laughs> will not. Only, it's funny, the only people that I talked to that found he was crazy were people that didn't know his physics. 
in that business. Actually, there was one, I'm not going to say who, but there was a family members uh, of his. I said, I talked to him and he goes, he goes, oh, you know, he would, they, everyone called him Johnny. You know, they said, oh, he's like Johnny. He was, he was, um, he couldn't, he kept on saying, how come the quantum, how come the quantum? And then when that got too hard for him, he said, how come existence? And so he said it was very almost disgust. And so, but uh, but other physicists take it more. Uh, can I just relate? Sorry to uh, yeah, go ahead. To get, but I was in Santa Fe once, sitting next to Murray Gelman, and Wheeler was giving a lecture. Murray leant over and he said, "Such a brilliant man, but always this streak of craziness." Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So this is from uh, Misner Thorne in Zurich. One of them's a Nobel laureate there. Was poetic imagination with its deep, almost philosophical questions such as how can the quantum, how can existence combine his engineering common sense that brought many of, of his lofty ideas down to earth with his trademark of doing physics. This is enduring a legacy, right, make an experiment basically. All right, so this is Witten, Ed Witten on Wheeler, and I think everyone here knows Ed Witten, right? So in my career, I've made uh, small dumps, jumps, really, really small jumps. Uh, what uh, Wheeler was talking about was enormous jump. And he does say at the beginning of the essay, he has no idea if this will take 10, 100, or 1,000 years. Right? So in other words, this is, this is very, there's a lot of information. In the very fact. Okay. So uh, Occam's razor, this stuff's really simple. All this stuff goes back to just self-reference. That's it. And we're putting some mathematical teeth on it. All right. All right. And here's a quote from him. I'll let you read it. This is from his notebook. This is about 1991. Uh, from the, he, he would cut and paste things on his notebooks. Uh, to my mind, there must be at the bottom of it all, not an equation, but an utterly simple idea. To me, that idea, when we finally discover it, will be so compelling, compelling, so inevitable, that we will say to one another, oh, how beautiful, how could it have been otherwise? And he made sure to put that, he quoted it there in his notebook. <laughs> all right, and again, uh, my thank you again, but my friend Scott is, happens to be here by, uh, by uh, chance here, and uh, Scott... He's he's helped me sharpen my axe and uh, and Paul is helping me chop down the tree. So uh, and then a bunch of other people here in the Wheeler family in ASU. Thank you guys. Yeah. Well, I do have a lot of questions, but I can ask them uh, anytime. So uh, do we have any questions? That was very fast. I think especially it's a time. Uh, so, yeah, minutes to spare too. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yeah, that is very fast, especially if you have not gone over Gödel's theorem. <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'm a practical person. Um, there are these emergent views of um, measurement, emergent models of measurement based on decoherence and quantum Darwinism right. and all these. Is there a backwards flow of, of uh, inspiration from physics to to mathematics? That, you know, you can imagine maybe multiple mathematical domains somehow uh, cons uh, each being consistent or, or like corresponding to the unitary evol evolution, but somehow the way they interact with each other uh, corresponds to the equivalent of measurement. So is there any like better right. flow okay. inspiration? So so I think the main thing, there there is kind of a feeling I see among theoreticians that decoherence is sometimes is somehow more fundamental than the, those postulates of quantum mechanics of just unitary measurement and uh, non—I mean, non-unitary measurement, and unitary evolution. I'm just saying that decoherence. So you, this is the ground. This is it. That's the bottom floor. The bottom floor is that, and then you could build decoherence on top of that. Does, does that make sense? So at the bottom, you have just these very simple textbook quantum mechanics, and decoherence is the second floor that you build on that. Does that make sense? And, and I could get to, uh, is that is that satisfying? I, I don't understand, <laughs> because I don't understand your question exactly. Because uh, you're saying, can you, can you, so so just to be clear, decoherence has not solved the measurement problem. I mean, that's very clear. Look at uh, the paper by Schlosshauer. Schlosshauer goes into depth about that, okay? So I think for, first we need to understand that decoherence has not solved the measurement problem. So look at his paper. Well, you did. So, do you, do you agree with that? He agree, Paul agrees with that. That decoherence does not solve the measurement problem. 
I think it's still interesting to look at. Uh, oh, yeah, the difference as well. Yeah. Thought evolution of like how difference and what is emergent is models of measurement. Mm -hmm. Try to solve measurement that is any equivalent in mathematics. Uh, we try to like make it more consistent, you know, from this more practical emergent point of view. Make it more consistent. You well, can introduce a meta level description, which just still have the same problems. Yeah, yeah. Like you can't get rid of them. You just add a new set of labels, and then the set, new set of labels has the same problem with the underlying set of labels. Right. Yeah. I have a rather different question. Okay. Um, the, the, the problem about um, classifying topologies and yes. um, that really makes a nonsense of uh, things like eternal inflation and multiverse interpretations. Uh, for example, a measure on the landscape of uh, probabilities and anthropology. I mean, mathematically, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't. Oh, right. Sorry. So, um, uh, so I, I don't see the connection. But well, yeah. a fashionable uh, idea is that um, uh, the, the biofriendliness of our universe is just a, a selection effect, right, that and enough. that if you have a string theory a Lagrangian, that there's 10 to the 500 or possibly uh, an infinite yeah. number of states. I'm familiar with each that. Each representing yeah. a possible universe. And then people say, well, what's the probability that you have a universe like ours? They try to put a measure. Uh, of the okay, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Okay. Of, uh, states I understand. that come out of the string theory. Oh. And they sort of grind to a halt and say they can't do it. But it seems to me that you, you can prove it's it's not even a solvable problem. Oh. I know at least Spoken tried it on the other half and. Uh, and then he's Saskin, and, and uh, uh, it's gone that way, really. I think with yeah. you as well. I, tried to I think you might be right. Into that. But it seems like what you've been saying is knocks it on the head anyway. You just can't put a measure, because you can't, if there's no way that you can categorize all the topologies that you go into that. Yeah, so I, so first of all, I've never, I haven't thought about that. This is the first time that I, it's even crossed my mind. So, and I agree with you, I think that's right. I will tell you the one objection people will say, because there's a lot of, <laughs> I'll just I'll just say, the one objection they'll say is, well, there are models where you can restrict the topology. Even if you just restrict, even if you just say this one certain topology can't be involved, then that gets rid of the whole undecidability. And so some people will fight that. But again, what I will go back to the argument I put here is, okay, but that's not the postulates of general relativity, and that's not the postulates of, of quantum gravity. So you either have to say, Let's just restrict topology, like I just said right here, which doesn't do anything to nature, or you have to prove it. Right. So you have so, to you right. recommend general relativity of quantum mechanics with another criteria, but you can tell the very problematic. Uh, yeah, topological restriction, which doesn't yeah. exist, yeah. Uh, as far as we know, that has been proven. Sim similar to cosmic censorship or uh, uh, chronology protection, these are other ways of, of appending additional criteria to prevent paradoxical. Do you think uh, all of those restricted topology in some non-trivial way or like are those yeah. all topological restrictions? I'm just wondering if they're in the same class of restriction. No, no, whether they're in the same class. It just, uh, at first sight it doesn't seem like they are because well I guess chronology protection says you can't have close time like that. Yeah I think cosmic censorship so that seems pretty topological. Yeah. Cosmic censorship I don't know. Think these are all wide open Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, yeah, so that's that's uh, excellent, excellent questions. And uh, yes. Um, what is the connection in your mind between Wheeler's Law Without Law and Gerdel's completeness and completeness? Yeah. So Law Without Law uh, is just one of the titles of, of, the, of the things that went along there, right? Law Without Law is this idea of uh, you can define something. Uh, like remember, I was talking about definably and indefinable, like that's kind of what Tarski's theorem is, says, it says for sure you can't define this. It's this paradoxical notion, law without law, just how law without law is a quasi-paradoxical notion, just how uh, Gödel's theorem is. Uh, Wheeler's- it's the same thing then. Is law without law an example? Law without law and infra bit and all that, they're all the same thing. But, but just, are those examples, uh, are those consequences of uh, Gödel's work? Or, or Gödel's Wheeler, Wheeler was trying to prove that. Yeah, and so what I'm saying is, yeah, that th yeah. this is the same thing. Yeah, that's right. To understand Weaver's this with, without that, the clearest example is charge without charge, charge where you have a, a wormhole 
and, there, and there's no actual charges for the, the, the lines of force just through, through the well mold. Yeah. So you recover the notion of charge without putting charge in. So he, that became sort of emblematic of this selection. Uh, this this without curvature without curvature yeah, for, right. uh, for the covariant approach. Uh, you came up with a lot of this. Is there, is there something to the idea that nature enjoys a contradiction then? If it, if it so seems that seems like yeah. it, it seems like it. It seems that, that nature likes these quasi paradox, at least at a fundamental level. At least at a fundamental level. It seems that you, you see these, you, again, at the fun, foundations of mathematics and science, you see these things. Yes. Did Wheeler ever talk about novelty? Because, like, one of the places where Gödel's paradox becomes really relevant to this session. 